Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Corwin Monday Afternoon Webinar Series, your no-cost platform for superior professional learning. Today's webinar is Teaching for Transfer, Reaching and Applying Deeper Understanding with Julie Stern. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Ariel Curry, Acquisitions Editor for Corwin, to introduce our presenter today. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Julie Stern. She is a past social studies teacher and is now a trainer and instructional coach. Uh, she's also certified as a concept-based curriculum and instruction trainer with Lynn Erickson and Lois Lanning. She's also one of the founders of Education to Save the World, um, an organization which promotes framing teaching and learning around real-world problems that require innovation and a deep understanding of how the world works. She's the author of two Corwin books, Tools for Teaching Conceptual Understanding, Secondary and Elementary. I'm so excited to welcome Julie to the Corwin Monday Afternoon Webinar Series and learn from her about teaching for transfer. Thank you, Ariel. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm super excited that you are spending some time with us. And so the first thing that I wanna do is just hear from you. So we're gonna start right off with a polling question. Um, I'm putting it up on my screen, but then you should have a different screen that pops up. Telling me, why did you sign up for today's webinar? Is it A, the idea of transfer of learning? B, the term deeper understanding? C, I'm familiar with Julie's work or D, none of the above. And feel free if you're an early responder to write in the, in the chat section um, anything that you wanna add, especially if you select D. So let's see, I haven't seen it pop up. Has anybody seen it pop up? Oh, I see some people just typing in. Let's see. Julie, I'm terribly sorry, but the uh, polling feature has crashed. Okay. Well, that's okay. Some people are typing. <laughs> it does not look like it will work right now. I am terribly sorry about that's that. That's okay. No worries. No worries. So, yeah, go ahead and type in the, in the chat section to all panelists. So, I'm seeing a lot of A, transfer. That is, that's really interesting. Some people are saying deeper understanding, which is a little bit more um, requirement of work. <laughs> I'm sorry to you. I hope that it's, it's somewhat interesting. <laughs> um, let's see. Transferring learning across disciplines, I see one. Great. Deeper understanding is somewhat trendy in the United States right now. So I'm just curious to see. Who's here? And I actually peeked at the participants list and I saw a couple names that I recognized, which was neat. So good, I'll just move on. Great. I see another one that says is a requirement from my school. That's great. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so here's a question for you privately. I'm not asking you to let us know publicly, but just for you to consciously take a minute because I'm super used to in-person training. How engaged will you be in today's webinar? So again, this is not one you need to um, put anything publicly unless you want to. How engaged will you be in today's webinar? One to 10. So one being multitasking, I'm half listening, to 10 being I'm all in, I've got my paper and pen, I'm ready to make a usable plan that I can use right away. So I just want you to think about that for yourself. And it's not, you know, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so I probably would be on the lower end personally if I didn't leave the house um, and be away from them. So where are you, are you gonna be? How engaged will you be in today's webinar? Because I'm gonna try to be as practical as possible in today's webinar and let you have a usable plan by the end of it. And so I'm gonna set these little blue ideas, actionable ideas on some of the slides. So if you want to be all in at a 10, I would think about a standard or a specific content topic or a learning objective that you wanna use as an example today. 
So here's our learning intentions. We will understand that learners use multiple fact-rich contexts to build conceptual understanding for deeper learning that transfers. Learners use multiple fact-rich contexts to build conceptual understanding for deeper learning that transfers. We'll use a three-step process to build a unit for deeper learning that transfers to multiple contexts. So that might be very familiar to some of you, that might be Greek to some of you, um, but we're gonna hopefully understand what this means by the end and that it would be really practical for those of you who want to follow along. So this is basically it in a nutshell. If you're here just for the gist, I'm gonna give it to you like this. There was a blog post, actually my editor Ariel, who introduced me, shared with me about Elon Musk. He's the founder of, of Tesla, the electric car, and just an all around um, innovative, inventive guy. And he says, this is his secret. He deconstructs knowledge into fundamental principles and he applies those principles to new fields. And Ariel sent me a message saying, oh my gosh, Julie, this is your book. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, it's great. I'm glad Elon Musk also knows the secret. Um, and so I'm going to show you how to do that. Deconstruct knowledge into fundamental principles and then apply those principles to new fields. So here's another polling question. Um, and I guess if, if the polling feature is not going to work, we won't get to see unless you put it in the chat. But I'm going to ask you, how much do you agree with this statement? And so I'm going to read the statement, then I'll give you the choices. I sometimes feel concerned that our world is changing much faster than our schools, that we are sort of spinning our wheels with outdated stuff that won't prepare our students for their adult lives. So A would be strongly agree, B agree, C neutral, D disagree, E strongly disagree. And so I'm seeing some A's. I'm looking at the chat screen, some B's, some D's. All right, some C's. Okay, so a good amount of A's and B's, which is where I stand, um, but even if you're D or E, I don't see any E's, but some D's or E's, maybe you have a really innovative school, or maybe um, you just don't think that the world is changing that much, um, and school, school, the way we're doing school is fine, either way, what I'm gonna share with you is super backed by research, but I like to frame it because I do feel this way. I do worry that the world is changing so fast and that often we're spinning our wheels with tweaking school, but not really dramatically changing school. And so these are just some of the things that sort of worry me. The amount of trash that is collecting in our oceans, washing up on our shores. The polarization, especially in the United States, but I think it's true in much of the world. The polarization in politics, the polarization in our community. And so those are types of things that as a, as a teacher, I was just thinking, how do we really help kids to be able to address those? And so here's a vision of schooling before I get into the tools that I wanted to share with you all. I want you to picture a fifth grader, a fifth grader who has chosen endangered species as her passion and something she wants to work on for her end of the year project for the Great Innovation Challenge. And so she starts off Monday morning with a Skype call with a non-governmental organization in Brazil who's sharing some insight into what's going on in the Amazon. And they collaborate via Skype. After the Skype call, she and her teammates collect their notes and create some action steps for the next call with the same NGO in two weeks. In the meantime, they're gonna have two full days to work as a team to study this issue and they're gonna have a full day with an, an expert in the field who's gonna give them a lot of key insight into the issue of endangered species. At the end of the year, she'll present her findings at the World Conference on Ecology as a very young person presenting her findings and what she thinks can be done about it. 
And if she does a great job, she'll get badges for her digital portfolio for things like problem solving, her technical skills, her conceptual understanding, her critical thinking, her collaboration, and her media literacy. And so my question for you is, how similar is this vision from your current context? I want to see what we have out there. Is it very similar? Is it somewhat similar? Or is it not at all similar? So go ahead and use the chat function to share with us, A, B, or C. I'm seeing mostly Cs, one B, which is great. What do I mean by similar? How similar is this vision of this girl's school that I went through? So I'm seeing mostly not at all similar, mostly Cs. A couple Bs, which is very nice to see. Some of these are privately to me. That's why I'm saying it out loud. Um, and some of them, if you want to hit to all participants, then everybody can see your comments when you hit the send to. So most of the people are saying not at all similar. And some people are saying maybe, Julie, you're totally insane. That's so far from where we could be. But there's vertical alignment with this fifth grader. So she's been studying the concepts of ecosystems, cycles, reproduction, energy, change, organisms, and habitats her entire elementary school years. She knew at a very young age that she loved animals and had a passion for animals. She also, in second grade, started the school's rainwater collection program as part of her, her learning. In third grade, she worked for two weeks at a national park studying the habitats and the ecosystems in that park. And in fourth grade, she studied the BP oil spill and the impact that it had on the habitat and also the Everglades, the Florida Everglades. So with this vertical alignment, she's been preparing for this innovation challenge her whole elementary school career. This is my vision of schooling. This is the type of school that I would like to see. But I want you to see that concepts the concepts that, I'm, that I showed here, ecosystem cycles, reproduction, energy, change, organisms, and habitats, are organizing ideas. They're mental constructs and organizing ideas. And they go from more specific to sort of more abstract throughout the grade level. So for a kindergartner, these are concepts. Plants, animals, insects, fish, people. They're organizing ideas of which have characteristics and the different um, examples in the groups share those characteristics. When they get a little bit older, those concepts become the concept of living things. Maybe somewhere around fifth grade, they become organisms. And then as they get even older, it turns into things like biotic factors and abiotic factors. And so in this vision that I have for schooling, the concepts would, the curriculum would be vertically aligned so that kids could easily be able to access complex problems. So now to get to how does this happen? How does learning transfer happen? This is it in a nutshell. These are my three steps that I'm giving this to you guys as boiled down as I can. So first, write a big idea or a conceptual relationship. Turn it into an abstract conceptual question and then use fact-rich context to illuminate the relationship. So the actionable idea I have for you down here is select the learning ob objective to use today for these three steps. So I wanna say a quick thing about Twitter. I have my, my Twitter handle at the bottom here. And just to make it worth your while, if you have Twitter, I'm gonna select at least one person at the end of this for a free seat to my summer workshop, if you're interested. So mention me on Twitter during this webinar, and at the end, I'll, I'll pick somebody. That's valued at $500, my summer, my summer conference in Washington, D.C. Okay, so I wanted to share with you a couple of relationships between my work and some of the big names of cool and authors out there. So some of you might be familiar with Jim Knight's High Impact Instruction. I love Jim Knight and his work on instructional coaching and also his book on high impact instruction. So he always starts off his chapters with these learning maps. And so he says, learning maps are about creating graphic organizers de depicting knowledge, skills, and big ideas. And so right there, the big ideas is the relationship to my work. 
as well as the knowledge or skills. But he also says if you go down to the second um, blue arrow that's popped up, that you have a core idea, a subtopic detail, and then lines and line labels are related to his maps. But core ideas are what I'm talking about as well. And then, of course, he talks about concept maps and concept structures in his types of maps. If you're familiar with the learning challenge by Nottingham, so the learning challenge is something that's becoming really popular now, and it's a great way of thinking about putting students in the pit so that they struggle, and then eureka moment happens when they come out of the learning pit. And so Nottingham also talks about concepts, and he also talks about transfer, and he has a lot of similar language. He even has the structure of knowledge in his book. If you're familiar with John Hattie, who I call the king of research, he has this graphic of surface, deep, and transfer of learning. And he says that when students have surface understanding and deep understanding together, that's when they form conceptual understanding, and that's when transfer happens. Hattie calls concepts the coat hangers on which students hang their ideas. And so there's more. I'm just sharing you these three um, pieces of research that show that uh, align to my work in case you're familiar with them. So here's my simple formula for a big idea. You take two concepts and you just state them in relationship to each other. Actually, this was not my idea. I just made this little groovy graphic. This was Dr. Lynn Erickson's idea, who's, who was my mentor for, for many years. Um, so you take two concepts, you state them together as a big, as a big idea. So my actionable idea for you guys down here is my suggestion is identify at least two concepts for your selected content, standard or objective. And then ask yourself, what is the relationship between those concepts? And so here's some examples of subject area concepts. And I'm going to show you a math one in a, in a, in a, in a minute. But here's some science concepts. Science is, is very, very concept heavy. Social studies tends to be very fact heavy, depending on, especially if it's history. Um, but geography and government tend to have a lot of concepts. And then for English, these three on the right are all for English language arts or any language um, classes, which would have concepts in, concepts in text, writer's craft or reader's craft. So just for you to see, these are con examples of concepts. And so here's an, a math example. And this is the structure of knowledge first done by Lynn Erickson, really just to show us a visual of how knowledge is organized in our head. And so here's the idea. You would have a topic of adding and subtracting. And the facts would be the actual addition and subtraction facts. The concepts would be quantities, number, addition, and subtraction. And so you put those together to form these statements, like quantities increase as numbers are added together or quantities decrease as numbers are subtracted. Oftentimes, this feels kind of like duh to especially elementary school teachers, but it, they're not duh to young people. Young people are just memorizing two plus two is four, unless we have those deep conceptual understandings that we're writing and we're being very intentional about. So here's an example for social studies. We might have a unit on world religions and celebrations. And so we study world major religions. We study some geography related to those world religions. But the concepts are beliefs, celebrate, celebrations, and traditions. And then we go up here to say, what's the relationship between those? People inherit traditions, beliefs, and celebrations from the past. So there are those big ideas are made by just taking two concepts and stating them together in relationship. And so we want to make sure that these are strong statements. So I'm going to give you some examples. Most um, standards documents that I read sound like this. Students will understand the persuasive features that advertisers use. And often we have to say to ourselves, OK, what are the persuasive features that advertisers use? And I've seen teachers, and I have done it too, where we go to Google and we ask them, what are the persuasive features that advertisers use? And we think, OK, that's what I'm going to teach to students. But if we write a statement that says, OK, let's look at different concepts related to the persuasive features so that students understand that advertisers use persuasive features, such as catchy slogans, captivating images, and simple but attractive logos, for what? For what purpose? To hook 
consumers. So that's a much stronger big idea that underpins the, the, the discipline of media literacy so that students can better understand it. Or let's take this one. Students will understand the relationship between the base 10 numerals and number names versus students will understand that each digit of a three digit number represents amounts of hundreds, tens, or ones. So just getting in some ways more specific, but it's also more powerful. Students will understand that there are different kinds of matter. Okay, what are the different kinds of matter? How about this? Students will understand that observable properties help us to describe and classify matter. So these are all elementary examples, but here's your actionable idea. Make a strong statement of conceptual relationship based on whatever your content area is that you picked out. So after we have our big idea, the next two steps are to come up with an abstract conceptual question and then take the students through specific context. And we wanna do that again and again and again so that they can transfer their understanding and deepen their understanding. So what does that mean? What does that look like? So based on those statements that I just shared with you, here's some example questions. What persuasive, so we wouldn't share the, um, the actual statement with students. We share the question. What persuasive features do advertisers use? How and why do advertisers use persuasive features? And what is the relationship between customers and the persuasive features advertisers use? So for place value, it's what is it? How do we use it? How does place value help us represent large numbers? And what is the relationship between place value and quantity? And then finally, what is matter? What are the different kinds of matter? How can matter be classified? And what is the relationship between temperature and properties of matter. So by sharing these questions, we get kids to really think about the relationship between these concepts, and then they go through their actual classroom lessons trying to answer these questions. So here's the stems. You may have seen a pattern from these questions back here. Here's some stems that I created, and here's my actionable idea for those of you who are actually writing this out. You can write a question about the relationship between your concepts for which the big idea is the answer. So you say, what's the relationship between this concept and this concept? That's the simplest one. Some more sort of uh, pointed ones are, how does this concept impact this other concept? Why do or does this concept create or determine this concept? Or what is the role or purpose of this concept in this concept? So I'm just gonna pause for a second because I have this actionable item. So if you have your standard, try to pick two concepts and state them in a relationship. And even if you've played with this before, because I know I see somebody who's even attended my summer workshop who's on this webinar. So even if you've played with this before, I think it's beneficial to take the time to really go through it because it's a skill and you get better at it with practice. Okay, so moving on. This is how I used to teach. This is a visual of how I used to think about instruction. I used to think about my topic and then I'd break it down into subtopics. I'd teach them in a very linear fashion and then I'd give a test at the end on A, B, and C. And so now this is how I think about teaching. It looks more like this. I have my question of conceptual relationship. I take students through context one, context two, context three, and context four. So they're constantly deepening and transferring their understanding in class. So this is a visual that I just created that helps me to think about teaching in a different way. So again, this is my very boiled down three-step process. Three steps to learning transfer. Write a big idea or what I call conceptual relationship turn it into an abstract conceptual question using those question stems, 
and then use fact-rich context to illuminate the relationship. And so I'll give you some examples of that, but I want you to, the action by idea is if you've written your big idea or conceptual relationship, and you've also written a corresponding abstract conceptual question, now think about fact-rich context that will illuminate the answer or the conceptual relationship. So I'll show you a transformed unit so you can see an example of what I mean. Here's a traditional unit that I would teach for health. Day one on healthy eating. Day one, I'll get students to explain the difference between foods with nutrients and foods without nutrients. I feel like I'm doing that every day with my one and three year olds. Day two, students will classify foods as predominantly carbohydrates, proteins, or fats. Day three, students will analyze the impacts of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats on the human body. Day four, students will describe the impacts of unhealthy eating and the steps to form better habits. And day five, excuse me, students will create plans for making healthy eating choices. So this would be how I would teach. There's nothing wrong with this. It may sound, a lot of these verbs may sound very similar to the way in which you think about planning units, but here's a transformed unit. Here's my big idea. I want students to understand a transferable idea, choices and decision-making in the context of healthy eating. I chose the conceptual lens of choices and decision-making. So here's my big idea. Healthy food choices can lead to a better life. That's the big idea I want them to understand. Healthy food choices can lead to a better life. But I don't say that to them right up front. I say, how do choices about food impact our lives? And so I take them through three, four contexts. First, our physical shape and weight, then our energy, then I take them through the context of sleep and mood, and then through our context of our immune system and the relationship between food and all of these different contexts. And so that's just an example to help you to see how we can transform a unit by simply by using this three-step process. So here are the key points I want you to take away. Conceptual relationships are what transfer to unlock new situations, the relationship between two or more concepts. We should provide opportunities for students to deepen their conceptual understanding through multiple facts-rich contexts. And we should provide opportunities for students to transfer their conceptual understanding to new situations in class. And so I'll probably get a question about this at the end, but I'm gonna go ahead and sort of preempt it, is about time. I wouldn't go through this huge cycle with every single learning standard that I have to teach. I write conceptual relationships for all of my standards. I would have roughly five to nine per unit, and I'd pick the most important one to make sure that I go through these cycles that transfer, that have students practicing their transfer. So again, the same slide, three steps to learning transfer. One, write a big idea or conceptual relationship. Two, turn it into an abstract conceptual question. And three, use factorist context to illuminate the relationship. Here's your actionable idea for this slide. You can send me an email with your plan and I'll give you some feedback. My email is julieharrisstern at gmail.com. You can also tweet it if it's short enough um, or you can tweet it in three tweets, but you can definitely email me if you want some feedback on your plan. So I'm just gonna repeat this a couple slides that I've, I went through quickly and also as Ariel saying in the chat section, we're gonna send the PowerPoint out for everybody at the end. But here's the simple formula for big ideas. Two or more concepts stated in relationship. I am a big fan of understanding by design. I used it for many years before I came across Lynn Erickson's work. Um, and for me, when I came across Lynn Erickson's work, I said to myself, ah, oh, this would have been so much more helpful for creating those enduring understandings is two or more concepts stated in relationship. And since then, the research has just been pouring out in support of this, this notion. So then here's my conceptual inquiry cycle. Once you have a big idea, you turn it into a question and you take students through multiple specific contexts that illuminate the answers. And so I say fact rich because facts are still really important. Facts indeed illuminate the abstract concepts. You can't understand what plants are if you don't have, if you don't study actual specific plants. And so I just want to end before we jump, we get to questions with a kind of big 
secondary example because I've been giving you a lot of, of elementary examples. So here's a, something that I came up with, um, especially after I was living in Bogota, Colombia, and this guy was, was in prison in Bogota, Colombia. Confessions of a political hacker. So he's in prison in, in Bogota for actually using cyber manipulation on elections in a number of countries. And so I said, okay, how will we scaffold to a place where, where secondary school students could create a social media campaign to reduce the influence of cyber manipulation on political elections. And so the questions that I have for you as I go through this is, how will students be able to unlock this enormously complex challenge? And how do we scaffold to this level without spoon feeding it for them? So if they're going to create a social media campaign to reduce the influence of cyber manipulation on political elections, what do they need to understand? So we're thinking about an abstract conceptual question and, and specific context. So the abstract question that we shared with students is, what is the relationship between invasion, between invasion and falsification? What is the relationship between invasion and falsification or like fake, faking something? So we actually made this an interdisciplinary unit between social studies, physical education, and technology, ICT technology class. And so in social studies, they were studying World War II, and they said, let's look at the context of the ghost army that the Allied forces used during World War II to say, what's the relationship between invasion and falsification? So the students could see that this ghost army made um, the enemies think that they were invading in one spot so that they can invade in another one. In PE class, looking at invasion games and asking them, what's the relationship between invasion and falsification and looking at fake outs in different invasion games. And then in ICT class and technology class, the students looked at phishing emails, PH phishing emails where your, this is an actual email that I'm sharing. I'm showing this to you guys for, with the Clinton campaign, where someone accidentally thought this was real and went to this link and entered their their password, and this allowed um, WikiLeaks and others to get access to to their email. And so, through these three different contexts that they studied, they students came to understand that invasion utilizes falsification to create open spaces for attack. In all of those very World War II and basketball and fishing scams, they all have this big idea in common. Invasion utilizes falsifications or fake, fake outs to create open spaces for attack. And so how do we still get them to this level of creating a social media campaign to reduce the influence of cyber manipulation on political elections? How will students be able to unlock it? And how do we scaffold to this level? Well, some additional big ideas were embedded into each of the courses. So for social studies, they understood that historians investigate sources and conduct independent research on claims to determine the reliability of a text. Because if we're asking kids to do a campaign on cyber manipulation, it's a lot of media literacy. So we need them to understand about reliability. In technology class, Big ideas, additional big ideas, where digital citizens act and model in ways that are safe, legal, and ethical. And technologically literate people curate information from digital resources using a variety of tools and methods to create collections of artifacts that demonstrate meaningful connections or conclusions. That's from the International Society for Technology Education. So I'm using the standards the whole time that we're doing this. And in PE, a big idea was strong defense anticipates possible false moves and responds quickly. They learned that from basketball and, and soccer or football, depending on where you are in the world. Strong defense anticipates possible false moves and responds quickly. So all of these are preparing students for the to create a social media campaign to reduce the influence of cyber manipulation on political elections. And so here's like an actual paper and pen test. First, we ask them, what's the relationship between invasion, falsifications, and strategy? And we give them a word bank, and we want them to say, based on your, your, the study of these, in these three classes, 
what do you know about the relationship between this? And then we give them the cyber manipulation examples. We show them different examples of campaigns <clears throat> being manipulated by cyber attacks. And then we ask them, how can the people of democracies reduce the impact of cyber attacks on their elections? So once they've really understood this new context, we ask them, what do you think can be done about it? And once they come up with some ideas, that's when we say, all right, take it to the real world. That's step five, create a social media campaign to reduce the influence of cyber manipulations. And we want kids to actually execute the campaign. So we want kids to actually transfer their learning to the real world. And so in my book, you would find, this is my adapted concept-based assessment tool. Step one, what's the unit focus? Step two, what's the big idea or the conceptual relationship? Step three, what's the new engaging scenario, problem or issue that you want them to transfer to? Step four, scaffolding techniques in order to assess higher order thinking. And then step five, which is just a cherry on top, how students will take action which I know the IB stresses, and a lot of schools try to get students to really take action in the community. And so again, I'm gonna to come to my three things that I'm boiling it down to. Write a big idea or conceptual relationship, turn it into an abstract conceptual question, and use factor-rich context to illuminate the relationship. So again, your actionable idea is to send me an email for feedback on your plans. And then I'm just gonna end with one more piece of research before we take questions. So Perkins and Solomon have done a lot of research on transfer starting really in the 70s. And they call something high road and low road transfer. So they say low road transfer are things that are really similar to what we've already done in class. And high road transfer are things that are very dissimilar to what we've done in class. What does the research find? Kids are really bad at transfer. <laughs> And what do they find that most tasks are in school? Their system, the, that, the tasks that we as teachers ask students tend to be very similar tasks. And the more we do that, and the more kids freak out if they're dissimilar. And so that's why I have whole chapters. Both, chap both of my books, chapter two, is dedicated to building a culture of thinking so that kids don't freak out when I ask them to transfer, especially on their assessments. And so my colleagues and I have added this additional dimension to the high road, low road transfer of academic versus real world transfer. And so we're trying to aim for this top right hand quadrant where we ask kids to transfer their learning to highly dissimilar real world scenarios. And we believe that's where innovation happens. So when schools talk about trying to create innovators, it's, it's key to think about it in this way. And so what, what my summer workshop is gonna do is sort of help us come from the lower left-hand quadrant where we should start with kids, so it's not totally overwhelming, but then gradually move into this top right-hand quadrant so that they can transfer their learning to highly dissimilar real-world scenarios. All right, so I was worried that I was gonna not be uh, on time, but I think we're doing pretty good. I'm sorry if that was too fast. So on my blog, edutakeoftheworld.com, there's a resources tab and you'll find a lot of, of information. Sorry, let me go back to that. On my blog, if you want to sign up for it, edtosavetheworld.com, there's a resources tab where you can find a lot of free information. And then, of course, there's my books and um, my learning transfer workshop this summer in June in Washington, D.C., if you're interested in learning more. If you're over in the other half of the world, I'm going to be in Melbourne in, at the end of May, so definitely shoot me an email if you want to hear more about my conference in Melbourne in May. Um, and finally, you'll get a, a discount from for the books if you would like to order them from Corwin using this code through the month of December. And so that's all I have as far as presentation, and I'm super excited to hear any questions that you guys have. I did have one question come through. I'll give it to you now. Sure. Do you use the conceptual inquiry cycle with every chapter or unit or subject that you teach? Do you use it with everything? Yes, I use it with everything. I actually now can't think about learning in any way, any other way. In fact, I'm playing with it a lot now for social emotional learning. 
So I would think, okay, what's the big transferable idea that I want people to understand, even with social emotional learning, such as, um, or even like people are talking about mindsets now, such as failure helps us to learn and grow from our mistakes. Failure helps us to learn and grow from our mistakes. And then I say to kids, what's the relationship between failure and our learning? And then I show them maybe an example of somebody who's failed and they've learned from it and they've grown from it so that they can understand that actually failure is an asset and helps us to learn and grow. So I hope that answered your question, but I use it for everything now. That's terrific. Here's another question. Do you think it will also work with all ages as well? Yes, definitely. It's just that the, um, you know, it gets more and more technical. The big ideas get more and more technical. And sometimes for the upper grades, especially I worked a lot, I work a lot with um, advanced placement schools and with IB diploma program schools. Um, sometimes my big ideas can be a paragraph <laughs> because there's so much involved um, that it's not just one sentence. So it depends, you know, a lot, a lot can, the way it looks um, on paper changes, but I use it from all the way from, I use it with my one and three year olds all the way through to the levels I was talking about earlier. One more question. Do your books, particularly the secondary, issues address social emotional learning ideas when going through your learning cycle that's a very good question no not the secondary book the elementary book um in some ways i like the elementary book better because it's my second one so i i has allowed me to do um to add some things so the se the secondary book the chapter seven is the relationship between conceptual understanding or concept based and lots of other learning initiatives, such as Understanding by Design, such as Common Core, um, such as International Baccalaureate, because I find so many schools have some, you know, something else that they're, they're implementing, um, and so they want to know how does this relate to this other thing that I'm implementing. And so for the elementary book, I dropped that chapter and added um, a chapter on, on basically preserving and protecting a lifelong love of learning. And so that one is much more about social emotional learning. So you may just have to buy both. <laughs> Thank you. I have another question. How do you assess for transfer? So both books, chapter five is a whole chapter on assessment. Um, but just that quick, um, I'll sort of go back to it so that you can see. This is, you know, my sort of how I think about designing assessments. So I say, okay, what's my unit focus and what's the big idea that I want um, to tr them to transfer? And then I have to think about what's the engaging scenario. And so sometimes like for science and math, I'll just make it up. Like, you know, I've even done ones where I'm like, what would happen if, and I make, you know, make up something. And so just because I want them to trans to show me their understanding, and there might not be another situation where it's so perfectly fit. Um, for social studies, I <laughs> I call my husband. I've had somebody say, can we call your husband? And because he just knows, he's a diplomat, and he knows so much about the world, where I'll say, I need a country that has recently become independent. Like, I'll just describe sort of the concepts that I want, and he can think of a country. Um, but really, I just, I, the, the step three is where I spend the most time thinking about um, an engaging scenario because I want it to be real world as much as possible. Um, and so that's where I spend the most time thinking about that scenario. And then step four is really important. Um, the person who changed my thinking about, about assessment the most is Susan Burkhart, um, and a very thin, easy to read book conveniently titled How to Assess Higher Order Thinking in Your Classroom. Um, she gives a lot of scaffolding strategies, and so I got her permission to put it in, in my, put those ideas into my books. Um, and so I, you have to scaffold, like what she says that sort of blew my mind was, if, if, you, if it's, if you get really, really clear about what it is you wanna assess, and don't let anything else sort of crowd it out. She calls it noise. And so she says, 
she says, basically, put a word bank on there or explain the scenario in class. So I'll spend sometimes a day, like we, I had kids transfer their understanding from um, the Arctic to the South China Sea and international relations in those two scenarios. So I wanted them to transfer, but I made sure that they understood what was going on in the South China Sea before I said, okay, tell me how it relates to, to the Arctic and how it doesn't relate. Um, and so really sort of freeing the idea that I'm, that I'm like giving them the answer by providing a lot of scaffolding so that I can isolate the higher order thinking that I want to, that I want them to transfer. Thank you. That brings us to the end of the questions. All right. Great. Um, so I saw some on Twitter. And so what I'll do is I'll read through them and I'll send you a tweet if you would like to, um, to whoever it is that I think to win the free the free seat to the conference in DC. But I really thank you all for your your time. I know it's everybody's so busy, so I'm excited that you participated with us. Thank you, Julie, so much. Um, so just so everyone knows, uh, we are going to be sending around an email to all of the. Um, all of the attendees with the webinar recording so that you can come back and watch it again if you want to um, just get a refresher for some of these ideas and some of the strategies that Julie talked about. Um, and in that email, we'll also have the discount code. So if you don't catch it here, um, you can uh, get the discount code from that email. And then I know a couple people asked about the PowerPoint slides, so we will also be sending around the PowerPoint slides to you. Uh, and that is about it. But thank you again, Julie. I always learn so much from you, and it's been um, great to, to have you on our webinar series. Uh, thank you so much, Ariel. And yes, it is okay to share the webinar with colleagues. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Great. Thanks.